Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome back to Fear It Goes. We are in the midst of the sex series. Super fun. I've had so much fun bringing this to you. We are on episode six, and today we are talking about something pretty juicy. And it may sit with you in a different way. The whole reason we're doing this series is to awaken some things within you and have you really start to look at the belief systems that are within you and whether or not they're working for you and who you are. Because I don't know about you, but I really don't want to live my church's belief systems in my bedroom. I don't want to live my parents' belief systems in my bedroom. I really just want to live my own and what's right for me. And this series is all about bringing the best of you forward into your life. Really, that's the whole point of the podcast is what's right for you and who you really are. And let's unearth that. Let's uncover that. I am your archaeologist here to help you dig up the most powerful you. We're going to brush away all the belief systems that are limiting you from actually being the most incredible you. Thank you, Gaia Morissette, for joining us again for this amazing discussion. Welcome to Fear It Goes, the podcast all about taking your fears with you and doing it anyway. I'm your host, Brandi Taylor. Hello, Gaia. It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast again. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You're my (laughs) go-to. Well, it's good. It's the beautiful thing about, you know, having an expert that can cover so many different topics. It's like, you don't even have to go searching for anybody. It's like, it's like easy for you. (laughs) (laughs) And let's make this easy for everybody else. Else, exactly. It's easy for everybody else. So today's topic in our awesome sex series, which is doing really well, by the way. Um, Fantastic. Yes. And it should be because it's really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting information in here. Some that's going to guide you and some that's going to make you go, huh. (laughs) So this is one of those episodes that makes you go, huh. Huh. (laughs) I wonder, maybe that's something I should consider. Today we are talking about monogamy and one-on-one partner relationships or when we move into the realm of more than one partner relationships and what that means and why we may have chosen to go with one-on-one or more than one or the many different reasons why we choose what we choose. Awesome. How can you not be? It's an interesting conversation. I know. All right. So let's start with, let's start with the, let's identify things so that everybody's on the same page. So when I talk about, I do a lot of uh, coaching and facilitation and training around, you know, monogamy, conscious monogamy, ethical monogamy, ethical non-monogamy. I do the whole gamut of the whole spectrum. So let's, let's, let's give those terms what they mean. So monogamy is true monogamy. There's a difference. Okay. So we're going to tell you what the difference is, but true monogamy means that there's no part of you that is sexually attracted to anybody else other than your partner. So that means when you see somebody walking past you, you're not like, Oh, nice. Uh. That's hot. Okay, so wait a minute. Mm. Are you truly telling me that you like true monogamy means that you are not even looking at other people? Because that would mean no one is truly monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> and, yet, and this is where we're going with this conversation. <laughs> so the answer is yes. The truth of that is, is that true, true monogamy, monogamy is that you are not actually drawn to, attracted, or checking out anybody else. 
that you don't fantasize about having sex with other people. You don't aren't watching porn. You're not reading porn unless it's porn that you've made with your partner. Like there's no desire whatsoever or draw to somebody other than your partner. That is what true monogamy is. It's interesting because of course we all think of monogamy as being um, just with one partner. Mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily only attracted to one person or, and I'm sitting here looking at the dictionary um, definition of monogamous. And it's quite funny because it basically says one partner at a time. Mm. That's a very interesting (laughs) definition, (laughs) which can be, which can be looked at in many different ways. Just saying. Yeah. Okay, so that's true monogamy. And the percentage of the population that are truly monogamous is very, very, very small. I can tell then you. We have, <laughs> then we have conscious monogamy. And conscious monogamy is more what you were talking about, Brandy, where it's that you are choosing to only engage sexually with one partner but you're still attracted to other people. Other people are attracted to you. Uh, You understand that your partner is attracted to other people and may check them out. This is conscious monogamy. Okay. Then we have what the average person that's never listened or had this conversation is moving into monogamy from an, and I call it unhealthy monogamy. This unhealthy monogamy looks like I'm, expect you to not be attracted to anybody else <laughs> go against your human nature <laughs> however i expect you to not be attracted to anybody else and um even if you are you're going to pretend and lie that you're not <laughs> all right that sounds awesome and i'm gonna pretend and lie that i'm also not attracted to anybody else And so you can see what ends up happening in there. We have jealousy, insecurity, possessiveness ends up coming up. Um, You know, lying happens a lot. Um, You know, sneaking porn, porn addiction typically ends up happening often in that kind of realm. Some of the other bad byproducts of that. Um, There's a lot of... There's a lot of dysfunction that lives in that delusion of, I expect you to be truly monogamous. However, you're not actually truly monogamous. So when I spend a lot of time- only have eyes for me. Yes, because then that means I'm special and that you love me unconditionally. It doesn't that's, mean anything of that stuff. That's not the case at all. That's not the case <laughs> at all. All right. Okay. So I'm- Pro whatever is in your best interest, whatever it's about being truly in line with who you are. So I'm not poo-pooing on monogamy at all. Okay. Is this a really important is that it just needs to make sure that you are consciously choosing monogamy or you are actually truly monogamous, but don't be not truly monogamous, pretending to be truly monogamous and then hating your partner because your partner actually act and resenting your partner and all these other things. Okay. So that's what we want to get rid of. We want to throw away unhealthy monogamy, get rid of that shit and drop into the truth of I can consciously choose. Sometimes conscious choice and monogamy um, is there's, there's a purpose for it. There, there can be a place for it. Um, But you want to make sure that you're moving from a conscious place. All right. So, Then we have, then we step into the realm of, well, I've been hearing this term a lot lately, so I want to talk into it a little bit, which is monogamish. What? Okay. I haven't heard that term. I've heard some other ones, which we're going to talk about. (laughs) Right. So monogamish basically (laughs) is like, we're, (laughs) we're exactly right. It's like, we, we are monogamous. Until something else comes along and I need to have it in the contract clause that we can have a conversation and negotiate that maybe we might open up our relationship. Interesting. Monogamish. (laughs) Which is what monogamish is. (laughs) It's like a built-in clause. Basically, at any given time, I can bring to the table a conversation about, hey, Susie at work's really hot. I think I might want to fuck her. 
What do you think about that? <laughs> did we just say fuck on this? Whoops. We both did. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. You never, it's since good. when am I not allowed to swear? <laughs> and honestly, this is the sex series. If we can't say that, I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right. So then let's move into uh, ethical non-monogamy. Right. Well, let's start with the two terms. Quite a lot. You hear yeah. that actually quite a lot now. Yeah. So we have conscious non-monogamy and ethical non-monogamy. Those are kind of two interchange. Uh, terms and basically it means that you are open to many different relationship possibilities that exist than just uh, one with one person now something to clarify here too doesn't mean that if you're in a um, ethical non-monogamous or this type of relationship where you've now moved into the realm of more than one person it doesn't mean <clears throat> that you are um, no longer respecting your partner. It doesn't mean, which we're going to get into, I know, but it doesn't mean that you're not respecting your partner. It doesn't mean that your partner isn't your primary person that you s- share everything with. It doesn't mean any of these things at all. No. no. And it and doesn't I- mean you're seeking to replace them, which is a big, big misunderstanding around the non-monogamous kind of world. Everyone thinks that that means they're replacing me with somebody else. That's not the case. Please continue. (laughs) Fantastic. So we have, again, like we talked about monogamy, we have the healthy ethical non-monogamy, and then we have the unhealthy non-monogamy. Oh, you mean the ones that are sneaking behind their backs? Also known as affairs (laughs) and cheating. (laughs) Yes, slash total trust breakers. And trust can be, it's an incredibly powerful tool in a relationship and foundation for the relationship. But this is what makes an unmonogamous or non-monogamous relationship work is the trust between two people. And if you can be very open and honest with each other, you could pretty well have anything work. However when the cheating affairs and all that stuff's going on because, hey, if the, what they don't know won't hurt them, that's a completely different story and that's trust. And that's your foundation now broken. Yes, absolutely. So we, just so that we identify. So right now I'm just kind of identifying the terms so that we're Sorry, all Sorry, I know. I'm page. just getting ahead of myself. <laughs> I, I know. Right? I know you're eager. You're an eager, eager little beaver. That's, <laughs> I got it. I got it. All right. So we have the non- we have the ethical mono- non-monogamy and we have our unhealthy non-monogamy. And so it's really important to identify that those are two different things. So let's drop into ethical non-monogamy. Ethical non-monogamy is where it's full disclosure. Everybody who's involved is on the same page. It's been talked about and everybody has negotiated and, and got their needs met. And there's a lot of conversations that happen. And it's all about that you're talking about that trust and that honesty and the deep, deep level of respect and communication. Absolutely. And that can play itself out in many different capacities. So we have swinging, which is where couples play, have sexual interactions with other couples. We have polyamory, which is like where you are in deep love relationships with other people. You have, you know, um, you have a you, you can have a where it's like one primary partner and then you have you know other partners that you you know may just fuck um, you know you might have a harem where everybody worships you that's kind of my favorite that's that's kind of my motto of how I work um, <laughs> like there's many variations and the important one is is that to figure out which of those variations work with you that's in line with who you truly are is in line with your love paradigms and your sex paradigms being in line with each other and this is the key to having successful happy relationships versus a disconnect which creates unhealthy and devastating and sometimes abusive relationships absolutely okay so have you heard the term ambia morris yeah, that's where you're like, you're, it's just you and then everybody kind of. 
Nope. So this is interesting. So I came across this a little while ago and I went, huh, this is a very interesting term. So very much like bisexual, right? Okay. So if I were bisexual, which I'm not, but if I were, um, I would like both sexes, right? Yes. So I could be in a relationship with one or the other yeah. or both, whatever the case may be at that time. Yes. Right? So ambiamorous is the same thing. I could be monogamous, I could be non-monogamous, or I could be both, depending on the agreement between the partners that I, I'm with. Does that make sense? So, yeah. you know, when you were yeah, saying yeah, 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 yeah. monogamish, yeah. it's kind of like that. Yeah. It's funny because I've never heard the term monogamish, but <laughs> ambiamorous actually is like identified with a definition. And it was really interesting when I came across it, I went, huh, that's very interesting because there's a lot of people out there that sit in this category. So I can be monogamous in a relationship or I could be poly or I could be open to, I could be open to poly, but monogamous at that time, or it's very, it's very interesting. Mm. uh, That actual term. That's very fascinating. Um, We'll talk about that later off off camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have some. I think it's just Polly thoughts. under a different name. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just uh, basically it's it's basically a different name uh, for ethical non monogamy, really. But because if you're moving from that place of ethical non monogamy, you're moving from a place of whatever serves you, right? right? So a relationship may serve you that you are conscious mono- you're consciously monogamous because that is best serves you at this moment in the relationship and you may have be open relationships because that may serve you in that particular moment with those particular people. But true monogamy, like we talked about, like what yeah. I was talking about it's in the beginning one. is true monogamy is you are not attracted to, there is no, there's no fluidity there, right? Like there's, it's like, you're not going on any kind of adventure. <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 like you're with your partner of that moment and that's that your partner the end right so i don't know if that's really a term right i mean it's, i don't, it's I, don't a, I mean I don't we all that. can we we can all identify as we whatever we want to identify as whatever terminology yep. you choose is <laughs> all that matters right as long as you you choose it you own it and then you carry around with you the definition card so everybody else is on the same page as you well, and it's interesting because I've come across a few couples recently um, in discussions where they have been in long-term marriages mm-hmm. um, and then they open up their marriage after like two decades yes. of being married. And it's really interesting, the conversation that I had with these couples just about why they chose to do that, um, where they're at now, how this is working for them. And it's fascinating because... So many marriages get to a point, and I'm not, I'm not condoning breaking marriages by any stretch. And this is not what these couples have done either. They haven't broken their marriages. They've done some really great things for their marriages. But I mean, if you're monogamous, you're monogamous. If you're not, you're not. Yeah. But it's never a discussion that can't be had, which was one of the interesting dynamics of the conversation I had with the couple. Because I went, well, what changed things? <laughs> Like what brought you to this point that would make you think that you should open the relationship up? Mm-hmm. And um, and it's just relationships change with mm-hmm. time and our needs sometimes change with time. And mm-hmm. it's fascinating because pretty well every marriage that is more on the open side, and again, they're not seeking to replace their partner. They love their partner. Their partner is their life partner. That's it. There is no other partner, but they are seeking the enrichments they find with other relationships and knowing that their main partner can't always supply everything they need. Mm -hmm. And to put all of that on one person to be everything all the time is they, they find this like not fair. They find this not real. They find like, it's very interesting. The dynamics of the mental parameters, I guess, that we place around a partner Mm -hmm. and and where they end up going. Well, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, it's like, there's our love 
there's a there's this concept that love means only one but that's not actually true you can love many you can love one more intensely than others you can love many equally you there's so many variations about how do we express our 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 love our, our love our connection since our intimacy our vulnerabilities with people you know and and then, yeah, there's lots of relationships that have been monogamous, you know, that that was a conscious choice. They were monogamous and then they chose that. They're like, ah, you know, there's, there's some stuff going on that we want to open it up and let's go do some adventuring and some exploring and, you know, expand our sexual development. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, that happens a lot. There's things I want to try that you don't. <laughs> exactly. And there's, there's exactly, there's things that I want to try that you don't and that's okay. It's like the whole idea of co-creation in partnership and love is very different than codependency, which is you complete me concept. And when you really unconditionally love someone, you want them to have the best of everything in their lives. And you don't feel like you need to be in, um, how do I want to put this? You don't feel like it's all, it has to be about you all the time. That is really about your partner and what they need and what they desire. And that there's things that you may not be able to meet, needs that you may not be able to meet, just like there's needs that, that they may not be able to meet for you. And that doesn't make it wrong or bad. And, and I always drop into this place where if, if you're listening to this and you're like, what is even happening right now in this conversation? <laughs> All right. I want you to take out the fact that we're talking about sex with more than one person. And I want you to drop into looking at, do you have many different friends that, that you share, you share different, things, different with. things with? Yes. Right. And the experiences and you have from one, like I look at the relationships that I have and I get very different experiences from one to another to another and they all enrich my life. Yeah. And I you, value them all. Equally. Equally. I value I them all. And that's a really important piece that when we start to switch out of these concepts and we look, we're leaning into these, these ideologies that we look into like, well, what do I do with my friendships? If sex not involved, do I feel like I'm cheating on my best friend because I went to the movies with right. another friend or we, you know, I really, really like, you know, going for walks in the forest with one friend and I like going dancing with another friend. Do I feel like I'm right. cheating on on them like do I do I but feel again like that, that becomes an ownership that's it about is. an ownership it's not about uh, it's not about the relationship and the quality of the relationship anymore now you're talking about ownership if I'm cheating on you if I am you know because I'm not all always all in 100% with you and you alone because we're not mm -hmm. we don't function in life like that we don't we have relationships with multiple people in whatever capacity that is, because they enrich our lives, because they expand us, because they help us move forward, or they keep us stuck, depending on the relationship. The ships, <laughs> yeah. on where we're at, right? But yep. if there's an ownership there, then I am yours. You are mine. And that is, I think that's extremely destructive when there's ownership of a person. We're not, yes. I'm not owned by anyone. I'm owned by me. Mm -hmm. And you're owned by you. And you have the right to make your decisions and the choices that serve you well. Now, if those choices do not align with my choices, then we have discussions to be had, right? Yes. Yes. But that's yeah. it. It's everything in any relationship is based on communication. And if you don't have the communication, yeah, the relationship struggles. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that piece of like you're talking about that possessiveness and that ownership comes back to this whole, I am a half of a person unless you complete me. <laughs> Which is so funny. <laughs> and you so complete me. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I right. Complete me. <laughs> I complete me. I complete me. You complete you. And then we co-create. And that's an amazing space to come from. Mm -hmm. When two parties are whole. Mm -hmm. and they come into the relationship, it's magical. It is. When we are lacking, we are looking to, we're seeking to fill our gaps with someone else. Mm 
And that's really unhealthy because let me tell you, you're literally setting that other person up for failure. You put them on a pedestal because they're filling something that you're missing. And then when they don't, you're super disappointed, you're resentful, you're judging, you're doing a whole bunch of things that are really destructive to that person, to yourself and to their relationship. Where is that a healthy space? Yes. And you're soul sucking. Let's just call it as it is. (laughs) At the end of the day, you're soul sucking. (laughs) Give, 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 give. Because there's no amount, because this is the thing, is that when you feel empty inside, there's a void within you. There is no amount of admiration, time, energy, resources that can fill that hole because it's an empty vortex. It's a black yes. hole that can never be fulfilled. And so Yes, it can you, though. It could be filled by you. Well, yes. It's, only by right? you. Only, only by, by you. You. That's this is the, the thing. key. It's yeah. that's the key. Only by you. Not exactly. by somebody else, not by some crazy amount of money, not by some crazy amount of success, not by the millions of things we can buy. Those will never fill our holes, our gaps, our are not feeling like we're enough or not feeling like we're loved, or whatever it is that we're not giving ourselves, they'll never, ever be filled from the external world. Ever. Ever. And no person, no person can love you enough to fix that other than yourself. Yep. The journey that, And I think that's the real piece that when we really, that's the piece that gets shattered in the concepts of conscious monogamy and ethical non-monogamy is that because even if you choose conscious monogamy, you're no longer moving from this possessive ownership place where you're, you've consciously chosen that you're not going to act upon your sexual desires for others and, and that you're going to focus your energy on the, just your relationship, right. Um, And not, you know, uh, focusing it over here and here and here. Um, but you're not moving from a place of possessiveness or ownership. You're not moving from a place of I'm empty and inside and you need to fix me and fill me. Um, you're not moving from any of those places. Because the thing is, is that even if you switched over into ethical non-monogamy, the truth is that you wouldn't actually be ethically non-monogamous either. Because now you're going to be soul sucking more from more than one person. Oh, you're going to no. be soul- Sucking you don't fill me enough, so I'm going over here. here. Five people or six people or a hundred people, it doesn't matter. You will not be filled. So it doesn't really matter when we're talking about whatever relationship style you're going to lean into. It's that exactly piece, right. it's the exact same thing. That piece of needing to fill that emptiness within yourself, those holes within yourself for yourself, um, because otherwise you're just going to soul suck your all of your relationships, whether it's solo, whether it's your friendships, because that's the other piece. It's not just going to be from your love relationships, like your partnership, sex relationships. It's going to be from your friends. It's going to be from your family members. And it's going to be from your children. Because once you're, because when you have that emptiness, you are, you are a energy vampire. Well, you're always seeking to fill it through others. Always, always, and always, it always. matter what the relationship is. And this is no. why we get into so much trouble in relationships in general. And relationships not necessarily just being intimate. They could be work relationships. They could be our children. They could be our friends. They could be our families. It doesn't matter which relationship we are discussing. When you are not whole, you're always seeking to find that through someone else. So when they don't give it to you, you're mad at them. You're disappointed mm-hmm. with them. You're resentful towards them. You're passing judgment on them because these are the ways that we are trying to resolve what we're missing Mm -hmm. without realizing that we're missing it within us. Mm -hmm. And once we start to see what we're missing within us and we start to fill that ourselves, your relationships all around, every single relationship you have will change. Oh, absolutely. It's incredible. Spills out into your whole life, every part of your life your job will feel more enriching or your business will feel more enriching. The relationships you build through those spaces will be more enriched. You won't have these meaningless conversations anymore because they won't, they won't matter to you anymore. Mm -hmm. 
the relationships you have with your children and your family will be will be much deeper and much again much more fulfilling and much more meaningful and the intimate relationships will be the same because now you can communicate on a level that you couldn't before because you were too afraid mm-hmm. whereas now you're coming from a space of loving yourself and being that whole person and now you can communicate pretty well anything because you don't need them to give you the gratification the confirmation the validation you know, constant the validation constantly propping you up and telling you how great you are because you already know how amazing you are mm-hmm. you already know and it just and, theref- <laughs> and and therefore you can now lean into whatever relationship style is best going to be in line with you i i want everybody to like take a moment and one of the things that when I'm teaching often I'll say to my people are whether or not you move from a monogamous space or you're, you know, a non-monogamous person is to ask yourself and observe the relationships that you have right now. Do you only have one friend? Do you only bond with one person? Right. Do you have many friends? Do you have many types of relationships that are non-sexual? This and will be a good experience with them. Exactly. And then that will be a good indicator of like, oh, maybe I'm not monogamous. And again, we're both here saying if you are monogamous, all the power to you. There's there's no question of what is right and wrong here. It's more no. just a matter of understanding what space you come from in these relationships. And making sure that you're in line with that. So if you are, if it turns out that you are monogamous, that you, it's really important that you communicate that and have those types of relationships with people, right? Like, you know, even in a friendship standpoint of being like, okay, I only have one bestie. You're my bestie. Are you okay with being my bestie? Are I are you okay with I'm your bestie and you're my bestie and we're just besties together? Because that's what it'll be like if you're monogamous, right? That that's in your friendships. It's important to communicate that and understand that and know that about yourself, but not from a place of fear and ownership and possessiveness, just like that's how you roll. Actually, it's kind of funny because I just came across a person recently that was very much in the friend space. um, And that's, they're really possessive in the friend space really possessive. They expect all your time. Why aren't you calling? Like, why aren't we always in contact? Why this? Why that? Because it's, they're looking to fill something and they're doing it in a friendship space. It's not even an intimate space. It's two guys I know. And it's just a really interesting example of coming at a relationship from a space of, of lack. I'm looking to fill. Yeah. So I think it's really important that we drop into like observing what kind of relationships we have in a non-sexual space. Once we have an idea of what those relationships look like for us, then we can be like, okay, how do I get my intimate relationships in line with it so that you're on the same page? So for example, if you are typically not monogamous in your relationships with people, and yet you've dropped into a monogamous relationship out of default versus like consciously choosing it, then you're going to be incredibly unhappy and unsatisfied and that relationship you're not in line. Your love paradigms and your sex paradigms and your beliefs are not in line with each other. And it's going to go horribly, awfully bad. It does every time. There's this hate, self-loathing. There's anger. Because there's there's shame. There's guilt. There's this feeling that there's something because it's wrong. It's wrong. I'm broken because I crave and desire other people. Like there's all sorts of shame that we, you know, that we are caring about ourselves. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So there's no right or wrong. You have to admit it. You have to admit. Yeah, but you also have to admit, like part of this is trained, right? Like we are taught that monogamy is the only way, and that every other way is wrong. Like that's that's just been the way. That's been the way that we have evolved as a society for millennia, right? However, back. Let's talk. Let's let's talk about. Let's let's go back further, which is okay. actually we are actually made for non-monogamy. 
we were nomadic. <laughs> and, you know, we, it took, before we understood that it took a man and a woman to make a baby, everybody was having sex with everybody and it didn't really matter. And it was just a tribe and it was all about expression and connection and uh, procreation. And it was like this, just this. And it takes thing. a village to raise a child. A child. <laughs> no, cause no one knew who the father was. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting because when colonization happened and when we started owning properties and needs changed, now we need people to work that farm. We need people to make sure that we maintain our possessions. (laughs) Which gives us power, right? The more property we had, the more property we could wield, the more power we had, the more status that was gained by it. Our dynamics changed. Yes. And therefore, and so, monogamy fit into those new paradigms. Yes, but not really. All of the romance and love stories and art and songs and poetry was all created not from a deep monogamous love, but from affairs and cheating of threat of death because you couldn't be with the one that you loved. Right. So all of that says a lot about on a historical basis that we still weren't monogamous. <laughs> like we were, we were, we got married as a contract. We got into and relationships as a contract for because family it was a and business wealth for a long time. It was a yes. business, right? And then we dropped into this belief system. A lot of it has to do with Hollywood and romance novels. And we dropped into this belief system that goes at the fact that, oh, this great love of this love that's going to be so, oh, it's going to change my life. And, and I can't live without you. And my whole Again, world you is, fu- you fill me. And all that stuff came from a place of that I can't have you. And so we Again, created a state of lack. A state of lack. <laughs> So we created it while we were having affairs. Like it was all coming from affairs. <laughs> so there was not actual monogamy. So even in the monogamous spirit of our culture, there was not really monogamy. Everybody's running around having affairs with everybody else. I don't want to romanticize that space, right? Like I think that, right. yes, we historically went into monogamy because of the, the, you know, the property owning and, and civilization and, you know, marriage it, it, made came, sense. it made sense. It made sense from a contract standpoint, from a contract standpoint. standpoint. Yes. Right. But as a uh, last and human desires go, it did not work. And so therefore we have a whole history of affairs and cheating and betrayals and, and death. All it's so interesting that because sex. before that, before that it wasn't, it wasn't this was right or this was wrong. It mm-hmm. just was, right? We yep. just did whatever we did as yep. a race. Yep. And then it became this is right and this is this now is wrong. wrong. And yes. so therefore, you should feel completely shameful. This is so shameful. This is, you should feel guilty. You should, you should, you should. Again, yes. influences that have been taught through many generations now. Yes. Because this has been part of our evolutionary process. Now, it's interesting that we're having this conversation at this point saying, this is a choice. (laughs) This is a choice. And you can make your choice from a healthy space that's about you and the partners you have or partner you have. Yep. And choose that from a space of wholeness, not a space of lack and not a space of influence. The influences we take on in our life can really help us or absolutely harm us. And which space would you rather come from? (laughs) Exactly. And it's important process of dissecting. Dissecting, is that that influence something that I choose? Again, it comes back to that choice. Is this something that resonates with who I truly am? Or is this something that I've been told that I'm supposed to believe? Is this mine or is this not mine? And if it isn't mine, do I want to adopt it and and own it and take it? Do I want to keep it? Do I want to because I've held it this whole time, time right? right? Plus, there's also there's like you said, there's some things that are you know um, that are beneficial to holding on to that were absolutely down, right. So it's just about a matter of I think dropping in this. I mean, fundamentally, this whole purpose of this conversation is dropping in and you know looking at 
oh, these concepts and these beliefs, do they serve me? Are they in line with who I am? Am I moving with that place of feeling good about who I am? Because I am not in constant internal conflict with myself and the others around me. A lot of people ask me what that means. And it's the love of self. And it's not an arrogance. It's just a knowing of who you are, what is right for you, what aligns with you, and what that means. And loving yourself completely, accepting all of you, every part of you without shame or any of the emotions attached around it. That is wholeness. That is us complete. And when we show up in any kind of relationship, monogamous, conscious monogamous, monogamous, ethical (laughs) non-monogamy, polyamory, whatever relationship, swinging, harems, it doesn't matter which one you go into, but you show up in that place of wholeness, of love, unconditional love and acceptance of self, it doesn't matter what kind of relationships you're in because you can navigate it with ease. And it's funny that you say unconditional love. I think most people go into a relationship with a very conditional love. It seems so amazing in the beginning because we fall in love in a space coming not so much from unconditional. It's because you're feeling something so amazing in me. And then that changes. And and I am amazing. (laughs) Yeah. I also call it, it's not actually falling in love. It's called infatuation. (laughs) <laughs> it's called it's called i'm high i'm high i'm high <laughs> i'm on biochemical responses that's right. <laughs> mean. and there's a huge cocktail of happiness that's going on yep. because it's new and exciting new. Yep. and that's what's happening is that's not actual love that actually has nothing to do with love i i mean i wish that we got rid of that term of falling in love instead of being like i'm high as a kite right now I'm, ex- <laughs> I'm infatuated with the newness. This is something shiny and new. And that's yeah. what I'm in, so excited about. It has nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with the, the happy drugs that the, your body's producing. Your body is producing. And this lasts anywhere from six months, four months, six months, eight months. And then after that starts to wane. That's when people start to see the other side of the other people. No, they were always there. Yeah. <laughs> they were always there. You were just blinded you- by chemical reactions in the body. It's totally true. Yeah. And you're not actually in love with that person because you actually yeah. don't see that person. Everything they do is delightful and wonderful. They burp and it's like, oh, that's so sexy. They fart. It's like, oh, it's so cute. Ah. You're high <laughs> as a kite <laughs> on biochemical response to new and experiences. Because when we look at what unconditional love is, unconditional love has no attachment to it. It took me a long time to understand what this meant. I remember the first time I came across this term and I was reading Eckhart Tolle in my 20s. And I'm reading A New Earth and he's talking about unconditional love without attachment. And I'm like, how do you have love without attachment? That makes no sense to me. Everything like when you're in love, you're attached. You're attached to that person. You're attached to that thing. No, actually you're not. You are not at all. You would do anything for them just because you love them. That is unconditional love. You do anything for them. If that means that they walk out of your life and they go do something else because that's what, that's what they need, then you let them. That's unconditional love. And it doesn't mean that it comes without some experience for us because it does sometimes because we're human and we're going to experience emotions. It's not like we never experience emotions. We do. But it's understanding what those emotions are doing and how they're how they're being used in those moments. Well, and I think that, you know, that place of unconditional love is, you know, a good way of starting to test the waters of on this adventure of unconditional love is, do you say, I love you because I love you. That's a condition. (laughs) Exactly. I love you because, which is a condition. I love you. If that's a condition, I love you when that's a condition condition. Yeah. Or you just say, Hey, I love you. I just love you just because you are you just because you are you. And it doesn't matter how you shows up. That's right. You could be a complete jerk right now. And I still love you. I may not like you. (laughs) Yeah. We're love love and like are two different things, right? right. (laughs) There's lots of people who I unconditionally love that I don't particularly like at times. (laughs) Right. It's very true. Very true. Oh, and that ability comes, and then we're going to bring it full circle. It comes back to our ability to love ourselves unconditionally. I love me 
just because because I, I was born. That's it. Yeah. Just because that's it. That's it. <laughs> there that's is all. no there's nothing else to the the rest of the sentence. Yes. Just exactly. because. Just because I am. Just because I, I am. am. When we try and justify something, we're again in a condition. I I found that this has come up actually a this has come up for me around money, just justification around money. And it's funny because at what point do we think that we don't deserve ev- everything and anything? Who teaches us that? Again, it's conditioning. Yeah. So how do we break that? And this all flows into the same thing with relationships. How are we looking at the relationship through a condition or not? Yeah. And this again flows into the whole concepts in monogamy or non-monogamous relationships. What conditions do we bring and are they resonating in alignment with us being whole or are they resonating in alignment with us being broken, which we're not really ever broken, but we're lacking and we're seeking, right? We're just looking to fill something. And it's not just your vagina. (laughs) (laughs) It's all areas in life. It really is all areas in your life. You're just terrible. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I've, been, I've been so appropriate. This is like the most appropriate I've been for like a whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I feel like I haven't shared any like juicy stories. Should we share a juicy story before we let them go? Oh, absolutely. Juicy stories are always good. <laughs> okay. All right. So I want to share my journey around uh, ethical non-monogamy because I think it it showcases all the different variables <laughs> that you can get to and explore. Um, when I was younger, I grew up with believing that you were supposed to be monogamous and that was what you're supposed to do and that's what everybody does. And um, I never felt right. Like it didn't feel right. And when I was young, you weren't allowed to even date. Like you, you thought somebody was cute and now they were your soulmate. Like you were, you were like going (laughs) steady. Like, I don't even know if I like you yet. Right. But that was the, that was the dating style when I was dating when I was young. And my mom, even my mother was like, that is so stupid. She's like, at least we were allowed to like date people and decide whether or not we wanted to like actually go steady with them. I'm like, we didn't have that option. So I needless to say, I moved in a very non ethical way and I had a lot of affairs and I cheated a lot on many, many of my boyfriends and I felt very trapped and I didn't, I was like, this is dumb and, and I don't like this, but I have no other choice. This is how things are. Oh, hang on. I have to ask a question around that because there's a lot of people who do not Okay, so who have been cheated on and feel that this is a trust that's been broken and they don't understand why someone would do this and it's very hurtful. So let's explore that a little bit so people can understand the other side. Okay, so um, when I was being unethical and cheating, um, it really was coming from this place of feeling trapped and... um, I couldn't breathe. That's what it felt like for me because I wasn't monogamous. And so um, to be possessed and owned in this capacity and not having a say in doing moving in a different way, because I mean, I was young, I was a teenager, right? We didn't have options. We didn't, we didn't have communication skills. We didn't have options. We didn't have anything, right? Right. There's no tools back then. And so um, for me, it was like this feeling of trapped and I couldn't breathe. But not also not recognizing that that's what it was. (laughs) Well, yeah, not knowing that that's that's that at that stage, I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know any of the things that I know now. Right. Um, And I can imagine the guilt compounded in that because you're like, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm doing this. I hated myself. I Mm. absolutely hated myself, self-loathing. I felt awful, the shame, the having to keep all of the lies uh, in line, um, the stress level, the anxiety that it produced. Like it was awful. It was so horrible. And also people that I cared about, I was, I was, devastating them and breaking their heart and betraying their trusts and and all these things that made me feel like a horrible human being right and so when I eventually uh 
around, I was about 19. I was with this boy. I was dating this man. And I had fallen in love. For me, I was bisexual. So I had fallen in love with this girl. And he would trusted me. He was like the first person who had ever trusted me. And mind you, I wasn't trustworthy. So it kind of was like a, you know, a little bit of a loop going there, right? (laughs) It's like, I'm not being trustworthy. Therefore, people don't trust me. But then no one trusts me. So I'm not trustworthy. You know, it was kind of like chicken and the egg kind of scenario happening there, right? So anyways. Perpetuating the cycle, right? It just perpetuated the cycle. So anyways, he trusted me. And so because he trusted me and I just became trustworthy and I just started to tell him stuff. I was like, honest. I was like, Mm -hmm. you know, I found so-and-so attractive at the bar today, but I didn't make out with them. (laughs) And I was like, super like, so open and incredibly honest honest that he was like and he he didn't have any framework for what this would look like anyways so I eventually I fall in love with this girl and um I tell him about it and he's like okay well go tell her I'm like what do you mean go tell her he's like yeah go for it I give you you know like I I I I go for I want you to explore it and so I end up having my first um, open, oh. honest, non-monogamous, uh, poly relationship that I had no idea what I was doing because no one talked about it. No one, there was, at that point, there was no books. There, I had no friends. I, like nobody knew what I was doing. And everybody was like, what you're doing is not okay, right? And so there was so much internal, like trying to figure it out and lots of shame and self-loathing. And, but it was like loving. It was the f- done from a space, space of go out and explore. explore. And it was, and it was granted. Honest. And it was granted. And again, this, I say granted, like there's ownership here, but he didn't do that. He didn't own no. you. He said, be free. Be who you are. Be free. If this is be who you are. are, then... Be that. We'll try to, and we'll navigate it and we'll try to figure it out. And, you know, we tried to figure it out and I learned a lot of things and we all learned a lot of things. And, but the thing was, instead of me f- hating myself for the lying and the cheating and the betrayals and all that kind of stuff, I felt it was awkward and hard and weird because no one knew what anybody was doing, but at least everybody was aware of what everybody was doing. And so and the trust is still said, intact. The trust was still intact and there was this feeling of honesty and I could love myself. It was the beginning of being able to look at myself in the mirror and truly love who I was and not feel like a horrible human being. And so I started that how journey. Freeing. And yeah. how freeing is that? I mean, here you've got a partner who accepts you for you, yeah. which is what we all should have, accepts you for you. Because you should accept you for you. And if you do accept you for you, your partner will too. But here's a partner who accepts you for you, honors who that is, even though that doesn't mean everything is about them, Yep. and allows you to be you. And there is such a deep, intimate, genuine expression of love in that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And so throughout the rest of my life, I've always moved from some form of ethical non-monogamy. Um, and, you know, I've done the swinging, I've done the poly, I've done, you know, playing only with my partner, having a primary partner and having lovers on the side. I've done all the different variables. <laughs> and for me personally, what works the best for me is that typically I have a primary partner and then I have lots of other lovers and like, which I call my harem. Um, and each person that's on, or I also like to call it team slut. That's another term that I use. <laughs> <laughs> because there's, there's another nothing dirty. There's nothing dirty or partner. wrong. Right. That's so right. it's embrace. It's a, it's a reclaiming of that so that there's no slut shaming part of me being a sexually liberated and sexually free woman. Right. And so, um, or person, sexually liberated free man, whichever the case exactly, may be. So baby. Or sexually and liberated free person. Cause we don't want to exclude all non-binary as well as Absolutely. binary people. So all inclusivity. All right. Everybody's sexually free and liberated. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> 
no shaming, no shaming. No so, shaming. And so that works the best for me is um, setting it up those parameters. Um, and each person on Team Slut um, brings something to the team, right? They all have different positions that they play and the different things that they contribute to my life, just like I contribute different things to their lives, right? And so, um, and that just doesn't work on a friendship level. That works also on a sexual, my sexual desires. And I get to continue to continue to explore and expand, expand. and develop my sexual, my sexual de development isn't stunted because I have lots of opportunities to explore. And the beauty is every single person is aware and all on the same page and all in agreement. Yes, no one is absolutely. saying, this is not okay with me, but we're doing this. No one yeah, is. No, no, everybody is, it's consensual. Everybody is on the same page. Uh -huh. Everybody's excited about it. Everybody is like, yeah. That's not yes, always been the trust. case. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I know what works and when it doesn't work. And, and in order for it to work, everybody has to be truly excited. That piece there is the excitement. Um, and that's, I think that's the one piece of advice I want to leave everybody with is <laughs> do not ever say, I'll be okay with that. And if somebody says, I'll be okay with that, run or the I'll other to be okay. I'll learn to be okay. Those two phrases are, um, going to lead you to down a path of a lot of distress and uncomfortableness and drama. Actually, there is one thing I want to talk about too, um, which is the jealousy emotion <laughs> that comes up when you are in a relationship that's a primary and you choose to open this up or you feel that you can't open it up because you'd be jealous. Jealousy is a normal emotion that will come up in the beginning. I bring this up because of this book called Opening Up. So it talks about all the emotions that you're going to experience when you open up a relationship, whether it be a marriage or whatever, but a long-term relationship, you open it up to being non-monogamous. The emotions that come up are normal and how you manage those. Because of course, you've been in this monogamous relationship this whole time, and now you're bringing other people in, <laughs> changing the emotional dynamics and there is absolutely going to be a process of I will get used to this or I will learn this because it is I will learn this yeah this is where there is a truth in that when you do decide that this is what's aligned with me it's not always perfect there's there's a bumbling period right where you were talking about yeah. like there were a lot of things we were learning when I had that relationship with her yeah and him yeah oh yeah there's definitely I think I think the statement that I, and I'll come back to, I want to really come back to the concept of jealousy and, and the emotions around that because that's a, a big and important piece. We can't have this conversation without having that piece. We can't. It. All right. But the, I, when I was saying that when somebody says, this is when you're in the dating phase, okay? So you are now creating your new relationships with people, right? So, so you, it's not that you've been in a current relationship that you're opening up. It's all for all of the newbies who are coming into your relationship in whatever capacity. It's really important that they really are okay with. It's not that they're okay with it, that they, ex they are excited and, and want to and, and that there's a motivator for them to move through their emotions. So this is why you want to be like, it turns you on and it's hot that you really want to dive into this because it will bring up, in order for you to de navigate ethical non-monogamy, it will bring up all of your shit all of your insecurities, all of your fears, all of your worries, all of your yep. abandonment issues, every <laughs> single thing that you have been carrying around with you since childhood, it is going to lovingly be brought up to the surface. <laughs> and stick it in your face. <laughs> and stick it in your face. So that's right. It better really get you turned on. The outcome better really turn you on to make it worthwhile doing it. And, and so that's that piece that I was saying is that, especially in the creating the new 
paradigms and the new relationships and if you're seeking out new people partners don't pick somebody who is new to navigating monogamy ethical non-monogamy because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in that if you're in a current monogamous relationship that you're deciding to open it up you're going to have enough enough things on the go in that you don't want to make sure you want to make sure that all the other people cause you less stress and less drama right so that's basically what i was saying around that okay so let's jump Meaning into your partner that you have chosen partner. as the one you're bringing in is yeah. not new to this too because they're going to have their own baggage that's unfolding before them and so yes. will you if this is yes. new to you so you exactly. don't want to have that dynamic because it makes it really difficult to navigate Yes, it does. Got it. It's a headache from hell. <laughs> <laughs> I have horror stories. Okay. All right. So this is, that's the piece of advice I'm leaving you with. It's all the years of experience. Don't do that to yourself. You may do it and just know that, oh, well, Gaia did say that maybe this wasn't going to go out work so well. <laughs> right? That was one of those moments. So let's talk about jealousy. Oh, jealousy. <laughs> What a wonderful, friendly, friendly jealousy. jealousy. Friendly, <laughs> friendly jealousy. So, jealousy is one of those emotions that has zero purpose. <laughs> it's like it's our other emotions. Like we have all these other emotions for like right. a reason, and it's it, it helps us. To they have great purpose. Things. They have great purpose. Jealousy, not so much. Jealousy is a base. Is a distractor. It's, it's a, a distractor. distractor. And. It's a good indicator that you are struggling with some deep, deep insecurities that you need to look at. Yep. So that, so when I get jealous and I, you know, even though I'm ethically non-monogamous, I have moments of jealousy because it's based on our own insecurities. That's right. So <laughs> the minute we are jealous, it's actually not about the other person on any level. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the truth in that. <laughs> All right. But actually, so, emotions are tells in that way for so many things. It's really are. about us. It's not really about somebody else. They're just allowing the experience to show us something about ourselves. Yes. But the thing is, is what makes jealousy scary. When we feel jealous, we feel entitled in the space of... It is their fault, and we go down the crazy train in a very self-destructive and violent and volatile way, and the more we allow ourselves to feel jealous, the more we feel justified in that now we're ready to, I mean, there's a reason why we have statements like a jealous rage, um, because that is what happens because it feeds off of itself. That's the, it's like, that's the, the thing about jealousy is that if you allow yourself to feel it, you will go down the hole, the rabbit hole, the yeah. rabbit hole of destruction Obsession and ownership. ownership, because that's really and, what jealousy is. And, and not only jealous, but it's because we feel like something has been threatened in, inside us our own shit, our own insecurities, our own fears, our own inadequacies. These I'm are what being lose this. I'm going to lose this. I'm not good enough. You're choosing them. You've always wanted them. You've never wanted me. Um, what, you know, what are they? They're better in bed than I am. Oh, they're they're gonna, better than they, I am. I am. They're <laughs> better than I am. You know, That's how, a big one. you know, I mean, people murder people because they go yes. into a place of jealousy. So if you're going to, but, the, but this is the other thing I want to say to everybody who's listening will say, well, why would I do not non-monogamy then? Right. The truth is, is that monogamous people are actually just as jealous, if not more jealous, yep. not the, co not the conscious monogamous people, but just the random oh, monogamous no. people. They go down the rabbit hole of jealousy like there's nobody's business. And you're still going down the rabbit hole of the, uh, you, you can't be friends with them to then you can't talk to them to you can't look at other people to the isolation of like, <laughs> where were you to now I have a tracker on your phone to now I'm going to put a yeah. tracker in your body gonna, so that I can know you where you are at all times. Like I'm going to snoop all your emails. I'm going to, because now this is just 
absolutely destructive. And people do this all the time. And I actually know people who go into these crazy fits of jealousy and it's just so bizarre. Because at the core of it is whatever you are afraid of that you are not feeling good about in yourself, you are projecting it onto your partner into the relationship. And it's like you said, it was a distraction. It's a big, big distraction. And you can blame somebody else. You can make somebody else wrong. And there can be a villain. And it's not you. But think of it this way too. We talked about conditional love and unconditional love. And I think jealousy is very much an uncondi- or sorry, a conditional love. But think of it this way. When I'm in a state of lack and you're filling it and I have the potential to lose that, okay? Because you're now filling my gap. So now I feel complete because of you and there's some sort of potential, some sort of risk that that is now going to be taken away because I'm not filling it myself. Now I am so... I am so worried about, and there's really, this is what jealousy is. It comes up that I'm, I have the potential to lose this. Therefore, I am going to play this out in very destructive ways to keep you here, uh-huh. to own you, to possess you, to keep you in, because I need you to fill this gap. Uh-huh. I need you to. The problem is, is that they weren't even filling the gap because no one can fill the gap because they couldn't. That's circle. right. No one, no one can fill the gap other than no you. No one which does. Is why? Which is why the only way to stop jealousy. This is this is this is how you handle when you're having jealousy. You need to stop. Take a breath, and you're like, oh, jealousy. Hmm. Why am I feeling insecure in this moment? You need to stop the train immediately. You need to put it back onto yourself and say, why am I feeling inadequate and insecure in this moment? What am I feeling the lack of in me? What am I feeling the lack of? It's the same thing with negative thoughts. Instead of trying to squash them, ask, what is it that I need to see here? What am I doing? Because everything shows you. Yeah. Everything's there to show you something. But- like many other emotions, I'm a firm, in other emotions, I'm a firm believer in like, oh, you can sit in that for a while and play with that. Jealousy is one of those emotions where immediately you feel it, you need to shut that shit down. And then because it's look and ask it because yeah. it's destructive. It's not an emotion that actually you can feel. Like you can't sit in it and actually process out of it. You have to acknowledge that, oh, I'm feeling jealous. Therefore, something's going on internally. Let's start to let's start asking the questions. What's internally going on with me? <laughs> anger, you can sit in. Jealousy, you can't. If you have jealousy and then you go into anger, you could kill somebody, that, and you could feel that's and you exactly feel ju- it. And you actually and will you feel, feel justified, justified in doing it, and won't feel remorse until maybe much later. So, so that's why it's super important to get a grip. All, I'm all for like, have your feelings, sit in your feelings, have your emotions, feel them, blah, blah, blah. Jealousy is not one of them that I recommend sitting in. You feel it, you allow acknowledge the it. To play out. Yeah. yeah, you don't allow that emotion to play out. Not you this acknowledge one. <laughs> that You acknowledge that you're feeling jealous and then you immediately ask yourself, what is going on with me? <laughs> Why am I? And you have to keep saying I statements, I statements, because jealousy is like, you did, you did. It's her fault. That's right. It's his fault. It's like you. It's projection. It's huge projection. So you have to keep saying, I, what am I feeling? What do I need? What is going on with me? Where am I feeling lack in my day-to-day life? Where am I feeling lack in our relationship? These are the questions you need to ask yourself. And when you ask Absolutely. yourself that and you get the answers, then you can be proactive about doing something different. And then you can also Absolutely. then have a conversation with your partner about, I was feeling jealous. Because I realized, I realized that, you know, I'm feeling like we haven't spent much time with each other and I'm feeling rather disconnected from you these days. I was wondering if we could have some more connection time. That is a very different conversation than you care only about that person and you're spending all of your time with them and you don't love me anymore. Those are two different versions of that conversation. Same emotion, same place. But and how funny is this that this honestly again we're talking about inside relationships here into in intimate relationships here but this plays out all the time in couples relationships marriages where one spouse is at work all the time yep 
or one spouse is spending too much time with their friends or, and this pops up and it is literally, this is why I said the dynamics are, we're trying to fill something in us. And once we recognize what that is, the communication can happen and it will correct it will correct the issues provided both partners are very open to the communication. Yes. But the more communications you have like this, the more times you sit down and have these real conversations yeah. that dig deeper than the surface of what we think it is, the more, the more you're going to be able to have these, the deeper your relationship will be, the more intimacy you'll have with your partner. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there, now you have some tools on how to deal with possessive jealousy. (laughs) Yep. This is so important. It's imperative that people understand how to navigate jealousy because it is something that typically ties in with lack love. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I I lovingly invite you, if you're wanting to dive into this, um, I teach a course called Navigating navigating ethical non-monogamy and i also teach a course called relationship deep dive and we dive awesome. really deeply into what around these concepts these topics how do we look at what our belief systems are how do we break down our love paradigms our sex paradigms our you know influences where did that come from do i want that do i not want that and so we really right. drop deeply into those places so if you're interested in wanting some support in that come see me you can find um me at succulentliving.com and I'll give I will give our wonderful sexy hostess here uh, the links to uh, that course because I think it'll be beneficial for people. And those will be listed in the podcast notes. So check them out for Gaia Morissette, our beautiful goddess here, who has been so delightful in sharing her knowledge around and, and explaining to all of you incredible listeners, the difference between monogamy and non and what that can mean in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, beautiful lady. That wraps up another episode of the sex series. And I am so glad you guys have been here along this journey. It's been so awesome bringing this to you. And like I said, at the beginning of this podcast, this episode, this series is meant to give you some food for thought, to help you get out of some comfort zones, to allow you to really dig underneath the surface of belief systems that do not serve you and allow you to really explore and venture into who you are, the absolute magnificent person that you absolutely are. I can't wait to bring you next week. I don't even want to tell you what it's about. It's so flipping exciting because we're going to explore something that a lot of people became familiar with a few years ago. And that's the only hint I'm going to give you. (laughs) So my beautiful peeps, come check us out at fearitgoes.com. We always have stuff going on. Sign up for our newsletter. It comes out once a week with some sort of tool or insight that's going to help you and you can implement it into your life today. I am all about bringing you everything I can to help elevate you and bring out the best parts of who you really are underneath all of the layers of limits. I'm here to clear them all. So until next week, beautiful peeps, have an absolutely extraordinary week.